welcome to Study with the Best, the magazine show that's all about CUNY. I'm Tina Beth Pina. On today's show, we'll explore CUNY's community colleges. We'll look at visual art at both LaGuardia and BMCC, tell activist Renata Hill's compelling story, check out the photo exhibit at Queensboro Community College, and so much more. But first, Queensboro Community College's art gallery recently hosted an exhibit where an artist and his subject had an unusually close bond. My name is Mark Asnan. For the past almost 35 years, I've been a documentary photographer. I started Uncle Charlie when I was 18 years old. My fascination with Uncle Charlie started way before I was 18. Growing up in Sheepshead Bay on a street called Neck Road in the 60s and 70s, it was really the Goodfellows world. So in my family dynamic, Uncle Charlie was that person. He was tattooed, he was a fighter, he had been arrested. One time he showed up to my house and you know, I was going somewhere and I got in his car, and he opened up his glove compartment and he had a, like a 38. And for me, that was really cool. Like Uncle Charlie was a tough uncle. March 10th, 1976, Uncle Charlie was never able to go back to work. In those days, it, co it was called the nervous breakdown. He went from like a big bodybuilding guy, you know, the tough guy uncle. He was emaciated, he was bedridden, he was anorexic. He received social security disability for a diagnosis of schizophrenia. In the project, in the book, you see some of the records from the doctors saying he has schizophrenia. But on the other hand, other doctors would tell you that was a not a true diagnosis. I didn't originally go to my uncle and ask him because of his physical and emotional and mental condition. It was intimidating to me. So I went to my aunt and she asked him, Mark wants to photograph you and photograph the family for art school. So he said absolutely because when we look back all these years later, I was gonna pay attention to him. So I went and made pictures Every week, I took this picture, and it's the first picture in the book. It's an environmental shot of the living room. And he's laying in this Castro convertible, you know, looking like he's dead. You know, and it's all window lit. And my teacher in personal expression told the class, even though I hate documentary photography, this is what you're supposed to do. This is in 85 Palmetto Street in the living room where he slept on a Castro convertible. From 81 till today, he's really be sitting in one room waiting. He's waiting for like the next day for life to be right. He never broke poverty. He never broke his emotional woes. His dream to go live in California never came. My uncle clearly believes he's a genius because one psychiatrist once said he was borderline genius. So he's, he takes that information and he uses it that he was a genius and he never got out. In 1987, Charlie's wife, Carol, left him and abandoned the children. For many years, she didn't see the children. She didn't send child support. That's when New York and many other parts of the country were going through the crack epidemic. And all of a sudden, Charlie was living and cohabitating with women who were addicted to crack. In this exhibition at QCC and in the book, you see women smoking crack, you see them living in the house with him, you see them in other intimate moments. I also had my uncle explaining to them that this is something he wanted. How Charlie wanted his story to be told, Blanca understood 15 minutes of fame. She understood that she was now being photographed. I photographed everything in his life because Uncle Charlie really gave me that huge opening. I told my story visually. I curated that, I edited that, and I then recorded him. And he got to tell his story. He lived it. I went home at the end of the day, and that's something he always reminded me. So here at the QCC Art Gallery, They've incorporated some of the text and in the room that they built where on the outside of his words, you can go inside and listen to him 
was acceptable until it wasn't acceptable. Loneliness and being alone are two, two vast different things. I was very happy to collaborate with the school over these 15 years of their support. I think the amazing thing about the gallery is that they're willing to show this kind of work in 2016. That's a real commitment to the students and to the community. I think when an artist or anybody enters into a project like this, it's hard to know the consequences. My five cousins, they hate that I expose their inner secrets, the darkness of their lives, and they really don't like that Uncle Charlie's words, which are so hard, were published in a book. Was that worth it? I don't regret doing the project. I got to tell my uncle's story. People will see it. I hope that other families look at it, but I do hope some people that they'll be able to see this work and say, that reminds me of my cousin's sister, but then maybe have a better understanding through whatever process they go through. Despite some daunting obstacles, Renata Hill is earning her associate's degree at BMCC and is on the path to a bright future. When Renata Hill made the decision to go back to school for her degree in human services from Borough of Manhattan Community College, she didn't let her criminal background stand in her way. Renata Hill is one of the stars of an award-winning documentary, Out in the Night, which tells her story of how she was incarcerated on one summer night in 2006. We decided that night, like, oh, let's go to the city. You know, in our head, it's like the city, you know, our, our safe haven. We get approached by this guy, and we didn't even get approached. It was just something he said in us passing. It was like, um, let me get some of that. So I'm just like laughing, and I'm like, oh, you can't have none of them. Like, we all gay, and all of them is my girls. I'm still not thinking that this could escalate into anything serious. So we going back and forth. That kind of just took a turn to the left, because at some point he got extremely angry. Um, he spit on me and threw a cigarette and everything just went like crazy from there. You know, um, our defense went up. Of course, we had to protect ourselves. During an agonizing trial, Renata was convicted of gang assault in the second degree, and she was sentenced to eight years in prison, but she only served three and a half. So when I came home in 2010, I was with this um, transitional program, and their main focus was for me to get in college, and my main focus was for me to get custody of my son back. You know, I got my son back and I started looking for jobs and it was like closed doors and the constantly the doors were being closed. I wasn't given an opportunity and everybody, you know, uh, but in the process, I'm helping so many others around me by sharing my story, by just like hearing them cry and I'm giving them words of wisdom that I wasn't even taking myself, right? And it was like, how am I able to help so many people, but I can't help myself? What is it that I need to be doing? And everybody just kept talking about, you should go to school. You should be a social worker. You should. I'm like, I'm not going to school. Like, I just barely made it out of high school. You want me to do extra years in college? So to shut everybody up, I'll put in an application. Six years later, Renata is well on her way to receiving her associate's degree in human services from Borough of Manhattan Community College. Her success, however, did not come without obstacles. It's going to be really difficult to find you an internship because, uh, you know, due to your criminal background and... Uh, yeah, a lot of the organizations that we, that used to, you know, accept students with criminal backgrounds, they no longer are doing that. Renata's perseverance landed her an internship with the Fortune Society, a not-for-profit community-based organization which supports successful re-entry from prison and promotes alternatives to incarceration. She is really, really dedicated in wanting to make a change for any individual who has that history of criminal justice. Um, she has seen some horrible atrocities, I want to call, while um, she has been incarcerated. But the main focus for her is really she wants to be able to move on so that other people don't have the same type of suffering or uh, incidents that she's actually had, that she's had to endure. Renata's struggle to find an internship brought BMCC's attention to this problem of people with criminal backgrounds in college. 
Professor Lisa Rose is dedicating herself to this issue. We want people to be engaged in the life of the college, not only in the, in the classroom, but we can, we can be really very, very critical. We can be important to, to people who, who come home from, who are re-entering and coming back from prison in being able to um, create the lives that they, that they imagine. But it's, it's really, really a struggle. So we have to understand what those struggles are. Professor Rose is amazing, you know, and I feel like that she's really down to like help this situation and to improve this situation. I feel like she see that there's an issue and that she's trying to figure out a way to implement some type of plan so that we, and when I say we, I mean fellow students that have a criminal background have a safe space in that school. I mean, I couldn't really be in a better place. I'm mean, not in the shelter anymore. I have my own apartment, a three bedroom apartment with me, my partner, and my son and her daughter. My place is like so comfortable, just knowing that it's not a jail cell, right? And like when I come home and I'm able to put my key in the door and know that I'm coming home to my family. Everything I went through all day, just at that moment, it's all worth it because I look at them and I be like, yo, one day we're going to be good. We're going to be all right. Like right now we are right. But one day we're going to be in like this really, really awesome like place. I don't know where, but it exists somewhere, you know? Yeah. Coming up next, BMCC art professor Charles McGill explores matters of race and representation through a kind of art that is entirely his own. You know, at one point, the formal training as an artist in terms of drawing and painting, actually conceiving of whether it's observational drawing or observational painting, at some point that gets left behind. And it's kind of like, okay, now what? One day coming back from playing golf upstate, we ran into some traffic. I wasn't going to be able to make it home in time to dress and out of my golf clothes and make it down to Chelsea where I was going to go and see an opening. And when I was there, a woman said, do you mind if I take a picture of you? And I said, no, why? And she said, I have never seen golf clubs at an art opening before. And that really was the moment where I said, if I can somehow incorporate golf, golf equipment, golf whatever, golf paraphernalia, if I can get that into my studio practice and combine it with my ever-present desire to work through race and representation, you know, it was a perfect marriage. I mean, you take this symbol of white exclusivity, white privilege, you know, white private country clubs, take that and rip it apart, rip the notion apart, rip the symbol apart, reassemble it, and let's start that conversation again. When I did my first golf bag, it was the lynch bag. I had a black bag in the corner of my small studio, and I thought, I'm going to download some lynching imagery, and I'm going to glue it to that bag. So I did that, and I made something I thought I would never make, ever. The raft of the Katrina bag was the one bag that is particular to a certain event, and only because the imagery on that bag reminded me of a favorite painting by Jericho, which is the Raft of the Medusa. When you start taking these bags apart, there's hard plastic, there's heavy, you know, uh, nylon stitching, there's brass, rivets, there's steel throughout, but you don't know that until you start taking them apart. And when you start taking them apart is when you, you see these are really resistant to change. And if you put that in a larger uh, context and you look at, let's just say, for example, the election of Barack Obama, and you see that since that election, there has been a lot of pushback, a lot of resistance to change. These are golf bags. They're meant to hold golf clubs and golf balls and tees and so on. But for me, there was an inherent other possibility for these things. When I was in the uh, golf store selling golf clubs, we would put all the golf clubs in the bag, we'd put the hood on top of the bag, and we'd set it off to the side, and I would look at it and I'd think, am I the only one who sees that this is like a little clan head person here? Am I the only one who sees that? These newer abstracted pieces coming after these hooded pieces, 
that is a transcendence of some sort of that prior kind of political slash racial, you know, element uh, that was very much a part of how the work was made and how the work was conceived. As I approached these found objects and started making art with them, I couldn't not make them with the mindset of a painter or a mindset of a draftsman, really. So this current work is what I like to call painting-informed assemblage or painting-informed sculpture. It's informed by the process that I use when I paint. So if you, if you saw, for example, the layers of color, texture, you would see what I'm talking about in terms of the painting process, especially this piece here uh, in back of me, um, Dilemma. The fact that I'm making these targets and there's this rash of killings by you know, police of young black men. I'm not saying, oh wow, there's so many rash of killings by police of young black men. I have to make something that speaks to that and I'll make a target because that looks like there's a target on young black men's backs. Ah, that'll, that'll, that's, not, that's not the process. The process is, oh, well this kind of works in this climate. The work really, in my opinion, kind of came as a precursor to all this stuff. And if we just want to talk aesthetics, that's fine too. Someone told me this the other day, they were like, you own the golf bag which I thought, you know, it's pretty good. Like John Chamberlain owns discarded car metal. I mean, I'm not saying I'm Andy Warhol, but Andy Warhol owns the Campbell soup can. I thought that was kind of a neat thing to hear, you know, that, oh, you own the golf bag. So I thought that was a neat thing to hear. Teaching at BMCC is, for me, it's, I get to revisit my post high school years. I love watching that process. I love seeing students when I go over to them. Most of my students are looking for like this little shove on the shoulder when I walk by them. And they turn and look at me and I go, there you go. And the smile that they get, because they didn't think they'd get there, but the fact that I get to influence students the way I was influenced early on, the way I get to have the opportunity to possibly change the direction of the way they think and change the direction of maybe where their lives are going just based on the fact that somebody said, you have it. You know, I love the teaching, I love making the art, and it's never been about whether I'm gonna be able to sell it or not. It's the urgency of making the work that matters most. Bet you didn't know that LaGuardia Community College is helping local and international entrepreneurs grow their businesses. Let's have a look. At LaGuardia Community College, NY Designs offers a space for new entrepreneurs, both local and foreign, to grow their small business right here in New York City. It's already a major challenge to start a company. Um, the failure rate is 9 out of 10. Tristan Bell is the director of New York Designs, a small business incubator a one-stop shop for helping young companies get off the ground. The New York Designs is a program of LaGuardia Community College um, meant to help entrepreneurs in the hardware technology and design industries. Um, so we, are, we help uh, very early stage companies get started and grow uh, with our facilities, with our services and with our fabrication lab. So we like to think about it as the fabulous lab. Um, it's actually short for fabrication lab and um, it's really designed for people to be able to create their prototype. Offering cheap office space, technical support, and some serious high-end power tools in this high-tech fabrication lab, New York Designs is home to some of the freshest innovators in the city, all sharing the same complex. From Shark Tank winners to companies named as one of New York City's next top makers, like Bot Factory. We're one of the resident companies at NY Designs. At, uh, CUNY LaGuardia. We're at NY Designs, we share a space with about 12 different companies um, who are also in the startup phase and do business in New York City and around the world. Bot Factory is a startup in New York City and we make desktop electronics 3D printers. Our machines can print printed circuit boards, the kind of things that you see in any electronic device, right in front of you in less than an hour. Whereas most 3D printers can only print plastic, Bot Factory printers are able to print the actual silver wirings that make up electronic circuitry. But unfortunately, 
people like Jeff often don't get to be a part of these innovations here. You see, Jeff is not an American citizen. Jeff is from Canada. What is the hardest part of coming to work in America? The most difficult part about working in America if you're a foreigner is getting that visa. Getting that kind of visa via, you know, working as a student is the easiest way, but extending that stay, that process can get, is very time consuming and very expensive. And that is a burden the city is trying to alleviate with a new upcoming program called the International Innovators Initiative into NYC. That program solves uh, a problem for international entrepreneurs, which is being allowed to work in the U.S. Into NYC is a program uh, sponsored by the NYC EDC. And the goal is to create pathways for international entrepreneurs to come and build their companies in New York City. If this sounds like the hot-button political refrain of giving up American jobs, it's quite literally the opposite. Rather than shipping jobs overseas, Into NYC is bringing industry innovators to America from overseas that otherwise may have set up shop abroad. And with them come new companies and new jobs right here. It brings innovation here. It brings job creation because for those who succeed, there's usually a big job growth. So there's really been a tangible benefit to the community by virtue of this program here. As much as possible, when a resident graduates from New York Designs, we would like them to stay as close as possible, ideally in Long Island City or Queens. Seven CUNY schools are part of the Into NYC program to provide visas to foreign entrepreneurs. With New York Design's history of growing new businesses in the city, it has made LaGuardia the only community college in the program. And true to its name, LaGuardia's involvement goes to support the community as much as the college. With these successful startups putting down their roots in the city, they bring that job growth right to the New York population. And now the potential for attracting economic growth here is all the greater, with Into NYC and CUNY opening the doors even wider. With a program like this, you definitely will see a lot of popularity. Everyone I uh, talk to who's from outside the United States working in New York or as a student are always asking me, how did you get here? That's the question I hear the most from every sort of potential entrepreneur or, you know, a new, a new entrepreneur. And I'm always, you know, doling out advice and CUNY is one more program I'm going to have to tell people about. If you have a physical product and you're starting a company, that's, that's a, we, we want to help you. NY Design has always been a great place for talented people to grow their business. And now with the visa process simplified, that talent pool for creating business and jobs in New York City is greater than ever. For Study of the Best, I'm Ari Goldberg. Have you ever wondered what it takes to become an artist? A special talent? A creative mind? Well, let's check out LaGuardia Community College's art program and see how they help their students become real artists. Artists are supposed to be open-minded and imaginative. And with having that way of uh, perceiving things, then you should also be open to try all kinds of formations of art. We guide our students you know, through their disciplines. We, we try to have a very a real generalist approach to teaching art. At the moment, I'm actually working on a sculpture. The object that I'm currently working on is I'm making a bird's nest. It's a very meticulous task to form and make each twig that's going to be the nest. And from there, I'm going to have two hands coming out of it and kind of like intertwining with each other. I make a series of skin drawings that are drawings on glass made from actual human skin that's sourced from the inside of my mouth, collected in small amounts over a long period of time. And then the skin is uh, pigmented with tattoo inks and dried to the surface of the glass to form images. The concept behind the skin works is both a material exploration as well as a way of translating this cheek biting habit into a more constructive outlet. So trying to actually channel the anxiety response that signifies the cheek biting into a visual form.
I've been at LaGuardia since 2009. I teach mostly the two-dimensional studio art disciplines, uh, including drawing, painting, design, as well as the capstone art and design seminar class. When I first started here, I took a sculpture class on the side for fun. And so when I took it, I was fascinated by it. I made things that I never thought I would make in my life. I realized that I was able to use my mind and my hands in a creative way. What we cover in this class is portfolio creation is one of the biggest takeaways. So how do students actually create and manage a body of work, a portfolio of work that speaks to their abilities and their interests and where they want to be as an artist? Well, we're currently supposed to reinvent the self-portrait. When you think of a self-portrait, you usually think of just like your face. But it doesn't necessarily have to be that. It can be a different form, like a personal object that um, defines who you are. And that's when you start to really think of who you are as an artist, aside from just who you are as a person. I try to you know, let them guide themselves to their own interests. Really make them think about, who am I? Where do I come from? What is my particular culture and heritage? What are my interests outside of the realm of art? Just so that they can know that there are so many possibilities in the world and that art can inhabit all of those spaces. My favorite, favorite work that I have, it's actually a non-representational painting. It has a lot of texture. I did it within one hour. And I remember I had brought it to an art exhibition and everybody like was crazy about it. And it, uh, that was like the first time I ever showed my work, displayed my work, and it encouraged me to continue doing my art. We want to encourage our students to get their work out into the world, have it seen by people outside of their classroom community or even the college community at LaGuardia. We had this wonderful exhibition opportunity for our students that happened this past winter, 2015, at the Falchi building. They approached us because they wanted to put together a holiday winter-themed exhibition. It was highly collaborative. There were these giant hanging paper spheres that the students then painted on and adorned with other um, collaborations elements and they worked collaboratively to put these together. We were very proud of what they did and, and, I, and I think that they were also very proud of the end result. The exhibition that I'm having at the Graduate Center is part of a, an academic conference called The Way of All Flesh. So my work in the conference will be an exhibition of a very large skin on glass work as well as a sculptural diorama. I will be working with some of my students from LaGuardia. I'm going to have students assisting me with many of the tasks associated with putting on a show. Things like art handling, actually installing work, deinstalling work, guard the work, as well as to answer questions that people may have, like a gallery attendant would do. We've been working a lot on a number of internship programs in these recent semesters where we're sending our students to the American Folk Art Museum, the Queens Museum, um, as well as some other places locally. And the students are getting this kind of real world experience in these internships that then make them highly competitive when they go to transfer to other art programs for their bachelors. I recently just got accepted to Hunter College which is like the school I've always wanted to go to. I will be taking art classes there. I will be majoring in political science. I can't turn away from art, that is a part of my life. That's our show for today. For more information on any of our stories, check out our website at cuny.tv or visit our Study with the Best Facebook page. Thanks for watching, see you next time, bye.